Well, here we are again for our last session of this morning, or should I say, the first of the afternoon, dedicated to financial regulation on infrastructure finance. The moderator will be François Berger, Executive Director of LTIIA. François Berger has a diversified experience in the fields of public management, project and structured finance. He notably set up the French PPP unit, then was the program manager of the Public-Private Infrastructure Advisory Facility, a multi-donor partnership program hosted in the PPP group of the World Bank Group. Our panels gathers Frédéric Blanc-Brude, direct, director, EDEC Infrastructure, Infrastructure Institute, Singapore. Olivier Gersan, Director General of, uh, for Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union at the European Commission. Gérard de la Martinière, who is still to be, to, he is somewhere, he is on his way then, uh, Chairman of Long-Term Investment Task Force. Emmanuel Nas Bridier, Group Chief Credit Officer, Group Investment and ALM at AXA Group. Véronique Ormezzano, Head of Group Regulatory Affairs at BNP Paribas. Christian, Christian Schmieder, Member of the Secretariat Financial Stability Board. And Eugene Tuchenko, Member of the Financial Group and Infrastructure Task Force, B20, Argentina, 2018. François. I take it over to you. I give you Thank you, team. Philippe. So um, this panel comes with a, a particular challenge. We had a we have a, a lot of distinguished panelists today, rich in uh, experience, uh, and that could certainly uh, hold the mic for a very long time. But we have only 60 minutes, and we're very much aware that we stand between you and lunch. And as much as we want to aim to provide you with. Uh, food for thought, we reckon it cannot fully substitute for material food. So we'll, we'll try and be very concise, and I'll be ruthless in uh, sort of moderating the interventions of our panelists. Uh, Philippe has already introduced uh, the, the, the panelists here, so we can probably skip this uh, initial stage and go directly to the, the substance. So the title of the panel is uh, The Impact of uh, financial regulation on infrastructure finance. And you would have noted there's no question mark. So it's not about whether or not there is an impact, it's more what kind of impact and what kind of implications uh, for the industry, for the uh, finances of uh, infrastructure. So we have assembled, a, as I said, a, a diversified panel. Uh, we were hoping to get uh, uh, Gérard de la Martiniere, uh, who has uh, chaired the uh, long-term investment task force to uh, maybe set the, uh, the, the, the big picture, uh, sort of the, the background for uh, their work. Uh, as it looks like he cannot make it today, maybe I'll, I'll very briefly uh, introduce a few of the uh, ideas that uh, uh, this uh, workforce came up with, and then we'll uh, turn to our panelists to uh, uh, sort of uh, answer, give their views from this specific uh, angle and standing point uh, on the potential implications, both of uh, already applicable regulation and, and potentially upcoming regulation as well, regulation that could be effectively endorsed and applied in the upcoming period. So <laughs> in a few words uh, uh, regarding uh, the work that's been done by the working group chaired by uh, Gérard de la Martiniere, uh, <laughs> the long-term uh, investment task force, uh, a, by the way, a market uh, place structure that was created uh, uh, seven, eight years ago and comprising most of Paris-based uh, uh, infrastructure financing actors. Uh, uh, Gérald has also a, a, a personal history of uh, interest for long-term financing. Uh, he had authored a, a, a report on the same theme 22 years ago, I believe. Um, so I, I guess we, we could try and sum up that the main takeaways of their report by the fact that, that there seems to be a number of issues uh, 
critical assessment, uh, uh, I would say, of some of the regulatory uh, developments, uh, uh, in particular in the uh, European uh, <coughs> sort of uh, uh, background uh, that have been uh, adopted lately. Uh, in, in fact, the, the report goes as far as to point to potential pro-cyclical uh, effects, uh, uh, for example, in, in referring to market value to try and assess uh, infrastructure uh, investment. So, a, a number of controversial uh, takeaways or uh, <laughs> uh, conclusions from this uh, report uh, that uh, we'll try to uh, discuss in uh, the uh, 55 minutes that we have now uh, before us. So, let me turn first to Christian uh, Schmieder from the uh, Financial Stability Board. So, the FSB has just published an uh, um, evaluation of the effect of the, the, the G20 recommendations in terms of financial regulations uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the reforms that took place over the last uh, uh, eight years, basically, since the global financial crisis in the field of infrastructure finance. You, you published it as a sort of a <coughs> consultative uh, report, I understand, in, in July. Uh, it, it covers the heart of our topic, uh, in particular uh, the, the Basel III uh, initial package of measures that have already been applied. Uh, and <coughs> I understand it, it concentrates on uh, uh, operational reforms. It doesn't yet really address potential upcoming reforms. But could you start by briefly presenting your, your main conclusion and in particular maybe elaborate on, on why you seem to consider that the effect of those regulations uh, are probably of a second order of magnitude compared to other drivers in the infrastructure market. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on this panel. So, um, first of all, I would like to say that with this evaluation, the FSB recognizes the importance of infrastructure finance as an asset class. It's an important asset class for the economy, for economic growth, and also links to the Argentine uh, presidency uh, with the objective of uh, developing um, um, infrastructure finance as an asset class. Um, this is one of the first two evaluations under the FSB's post-implementation evaluation framework. Um, the other one is on incentives to centrally clear. And the purpose of these evaluations is to assess whether the reforms are achieving their intended um, objectives and um, probably most importantly to identify whether there are any materially unintended um, consequences, and particularly negative ones, which, uh, which uh, weren't to be addressed without, however, compromising uh, on the overall effects of the reforms. Um, let me come to the, to the results. First of all, I would like to mention that this is a global exercise, so the purpose is to look globally and overall sort of whether the, the reforms on infrastructure finance um, are, um, have produced any any unintended effects. In terms of the scope, and that is very important, first of all, I would like to mention that the evaluation focuses uh, on the on infrastructure provided by the financial sector, so the, if you will, the private element of financing. This is a 300 to 500 billion financing uh, volume per year, and of course, it's much smaller than the overall amount of financing if you also consider the um, amount of financing by the public. Uh, second, and that has already been alluded to by Francois, uh, the focus is on the reforms that have been implemented, mainly those that are considered most important. This is the initial Basel III package and the OTC derivative reforms. These reforms have been considered quantitatively, so based on quantitative analysis, but also a range of uh, qualitative analysis. Forthcoming reforms were also covered by the report. There's quite a lot of material in that report, but has focused uh, by definition on qualitative uh, assessments. Um, I should say that the analysis has um, included a range of interactions with the private sector. There's been a workshop with, uh, with the um, private sector in London earlier this year. There's also been uh, interviews with market participants, some of which are in the room today. Um, a qualitative survey among uh, um, a wide range of investors overall with 100 responses and as uh, very recently feedback to the public consultation report published uh, in July. And as I said also multiple set of, of uh, empirical analysis 
for the reforms that have already been implemented. Let me very briefly talk about trends. Overall, um, the, the outcome of the analysis was that infrastructure finance has continued to grow. So the volume has continued to grow uh, in recent years after a small dip uh, during the global financial crisis. Market-based finance has grown in importance, and one important factor for that has been um, the search for yield or the accommodative monetary policy conditions. Prices has also, have also come down in recent years to low levels after a spike during the crisis. Um, for Europe, while this evaluation, as I said, has focused on global trends, um, broadly speaking, in terms at least of the volumes, um, the trend has been similar, so strong growth of, of uh, financing um, before the crisis, then a dip during the crisis, and in recent years, uh, volumes have picked up again. There have also been some changes in market practices. One of them is that the maturities of bank loans have, sh have shortened, and uh, the team has identified that part of this might be driven by the reforms. But this is not necessarily unintended, because one of the objectives of the reforms was to reduce maturity mismatch by banks. In terms of the, effect, of the effects, as already said, regulation has been found, and to the extent that uh, we're looking at the reforms implemented today to be of a second-order factor, uh, the main element for that statement is that uh, the evaluation didn't find a differential effect for banks with stronger and weaker um, solvency and liquidity profiles versus others with, uh, um, with sort of on the other end of, of the scale, and also very importantly, that the effects for infrastructure finance were f fairly in line and, and sort of moved in parallel with other types of financing. Um, the reforms seem to also have contributed to some degree to a substitution of finance. As I said, market-based finance has grown in recent years, um, and more generally, many other factors, and these have been mentioned uh, previously today already, macro, the macro financial environment, for example, the dip during crisis, we could really link that uh, directly uh, to, to, the, to the overall conditions, government policies and institutional factors, in particular for emerging market and developing economies, uh, are, are, were found to be, to, to be important. Uh, very importantly, also, we didn't find major differences in terms of the effects between advanced economies and, and emerging market economies, both uh, in, in terms of, of volumes, but also, also more generally, if you, if you look at both uh, uh, financing from the financing provider side and sort of from a borrower, uh, from a borrower uh, country perspective. So overall, um, the evaluation doesn't point to material negative effects on infrastructure finance to date, and that's very important. And this is also strongly supported by the feedback from the public consultation received and published uh, recently. I should say, however, that the international standard setting bodies, especially the Basel Committee, will continue to monitor and assess trends and effects, um, while also, of course, the G20 uh, initiatives are, are looking at other relevant aspects. Um, so maybe some more words on the, on the um, feedback from the public consultation. Um, as Francois said, there's been also uh, quite a bit of mentioning of the forthcoming reforms which have been assessed qualitatively uh, in the evaluation. Um, and um, um, one, one element is, of course, uh, that there is also some forthcoming, uh, some forthcoming reforms and there's forthcoming work by the IAIS. This will take into effect uh, the trends that, that are observed and the work that has been undertaken, but obviously this falls into the, into the purview of uh, the IAIS, and the same thing is true for the Basel Committee. As a general principle, I, I should say that regulation should reflect the underlying risks and uh, strike a balance between risk and sensitivity and complexity. This, this is a very important element uh, of this work. Thank you very much. Let me stop here. Thank you, Christian. So overall, a rather reassuring view from your, your report that the regulation has not had significant uh, uh, unintended consequences or uh, unfavorable consequences, even though you, you do mention the fact that, indeed, uh, banks, at least for systematically, uh, systemical uh, important banks, may, may have correspondingly shortened their tenors.
Um, let's now move to uh, Eugene Yushchenko, who's uh, here representing the, the B20. But sh I should also uh, uh, say that he was my predecessor uh, at the uh, Long-Term uh, Infrastructure uh, Association, uh, Infrastructure Investors Association. So, uh, uh, Eugene, in your previous uh, uh, position, you, you took part to uh, the B20 uh, workforce uh, during the spring on, on financing growth and infrastructure, the, the task force that was set up with uh, uh, a number of case studies reviewed by uh, members, comments on, on building financial benchmarks, all types of contributions that you uh, provided. The, the final report, I understand, is due in the, in the next few weeks. What's your, tell us about your, your main findings and recommendations. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. So indeed, uh, uh, this, this year I, I was for the second time a member of the um, um, B20 Task Force on Financing Growth and Infrastructure, which is, um, which is a sort of discussion and, uh, um, and, and debate forum for business leaders happening in the, in the framework of the G20 process each year. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, um, and, and some of you at least would probably know that Financing Growth and Infrastructure Task Force has been increasingly focusing on the, um, on the infrastructure topics, um, uh, starting from, I would say, three, four years ago, and, and more and more uh, coming, coming to, to this year review, which had as one of its central topic, infrastructure as an asset class. Um, and um, I think uh, like it, it was very uh, reassuring, uh, very important to see that level of focus and that level of support coming from the business community to uh, develop the subject. So what I will mention now, I will mention a couple of um, highlights coming out uh, uh, from, uh, from the final report of the, of the task force. Um, I think actually uh, the report was already released. I'm not sure it was released uh, to everybody or ju just uh, to the B20 participants, but it was released uh, in early September. And uh, um, it will be uh, included into the uh, final um, pack of deliverables, final submission that will be um, uh, done by the B20 towards uh, the, the G20 leadership. Uh, during the handover ceremony uh, late uh, late in November, and um, there were uh, uh, four highlights in that report that I would like to share with you here today. Um, first one I already mentioned: uh, definition of infrastructure as an asset class. What it involves? It involves better understanding of uh, risk and return profile for infrastructure investment and um, leveraging that knowledge in order to uh, uh, enable better flow of financing to the asset class and also, um, let's say, um, more active participation of project developers, project sponsors on the, on the demand side of infrastructure investment. Um, second highlight uh, in this year report relates to um, um, development of uh, effective and efficient uh, uh, PPP frameworks, framework for uh, public-private partnerships. And it's, it's really interesting uh, that, that between the turns, it's attention to this topic uh, this year on the back of uh, many years, I would say, um, well, not discriminatory, but at least not super favorable publicity that, that PPPs have been uh, receiving in, in, in different jurisdictions. So one of the recommendations there is to um, promote executional excellence of PPP, and this is more technical point, how different public authorities can learn from each other in, in making it work better. And another important highlight is actually um, for governments, for politicians to work on, on improving, on strengthening the public image of public-private partnership and uh, uh, doing an effort in the direction of uh, helping the good news about what PPPs bring to society, to economy, to people, um, become more visible. Um, not only the bad news uh, that end up in the, in the press when, when, when things with the PPPs go not so well. Uh, next highlight there uh, relates to, um, um, let's say, development of affordable housing. And uh, 
I'm personally not sure this is an infrastructure topic as such. Many people may argue it's a real estate. But the point, uh, the real point there is that the B20 group this year is turning serious attention to, uh, to the topics that we infrastructure investors broadly define as a social infrastructure. And this is a very important area. Uh, this is an area where a lot of action is needed and where a lot of capital is lacking, uh, particularly from the private side today. And there are lots of issues there, uh, notably uh, issues related to uh, fragmentation uh, of those projects uh, um, and, and, and also lack of um, blending and bundling solutions, if you like, uh, that enable a successful cooperation between private financiers and multilateral development banks in making more of those projects acceptable, uh, accessible to public. So all those topics have been raised and included in the recommendation, again, primarily in the, in the affordable housing context. But uh, um, my takeaway from that would be to read it as a, as a, as a, wider, uh, as a wider topic related to, to social infrastructure at large. And the final and, and, and uh, um, the final uh, point coming out of that report, which uh, very closely uh, links to what, to what uh, Christian was, was mentioning, is um, actually a development of, um, of infrastructure regulation framework um, with a view that best practices from different jurisdictions get uh, uh, exchanged and, 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 and knowledge there is applied as, as regulation developments continue. There are two angles to, uh, to that regulatory debate. One is related to sectoral regulation. So how uh, uh, can we um, regulate water utilities, um, energy uh, um, transmission or, or telecommunication investments? And uh, different regulators have a fair um, amount of information there to learn from each other. Um, without going into technical detail, the underlying, the underlying message there from the B20 is that what we'd like to see, we'd like to see, to see more predictability and more stability in how those regulations uh, are designed and get implemented. The second element is uh, related to prudential regulation of infrastructure investment. And the um, message is clear that more frameworks need to uh, come up in that context. Um, I think uh, uh, interesting learning point uh, or interesting starting point even I would say for, for some of the policy makers there could be uh, the Solomon Institute 2 legislation enabled, uh, uh, enacted not so long time ago in Europe. Uh, the way it defines infrastructure as a, as a lower risk, long-term asset class, and the consequences it has for investors by incentivizing more capital through reduction in, um, in the cap solvency risk charge. Now, we're not saying that the same solution should be copy-pasted in all jurisdictions. There are different ways of achieving the same outcome, but the message is that, uh, let's say, the, the regulatory view on infrastructure as a low risk asset class um, uh, with uh, uh, incentives to bring more private capital to the to the uh, playing field there um, is um, is something that B20 pretty much stand behind. Thank you, Eugene. And, and indeed, you mentioned among others the uh, the need for uh, better predictability and stability of uh, regulation. That is certainly a, a concern for, in particular, for a, a long-term industry like uh, like infrastructure, where by definition uh, the horizon is uh, uh, is in decades, not in years, and uh, and that potentially uh, provides uh, room for many regulatory changes along the life of a project. So definitely a. a a very relevant issue among the others you, you mentioned. Let, let me now turn to Frédéric Blanbru, the director of the EDEC uh, Infra Institute. Some of you uh, may just have heard uh, his masterclass on the uh, infrastructure asset class financial performance. As a director of the uh, EDEC Infra Institute, can you tell us about the uh, sort of market-based evidence you, you may have identified or come across or measured maybe to, to support some uh, of the, uh, the the previous conclusions and I'm referring in particular to uh, a Christian uh, conclusion that regulation may not have 
had a, a, a very uh, significant or instrumental role in, in changing the, uh, the, the scope of infrastructure business. It may have had a few uh, uh, side effects, like shortening tenders in banks, loans. So how, how do you effectively, uh, are you in a position to, to, to support or, or provide evidence of some of those uh, uh, moves? Moods. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, no, th there is evidence. Uh, investors are voting with their feet, effectively. Uh, and as we just discussed in the previous session, uh, we've seen prices increase significantly over the next few, the past few years, uh, which, to a large extent, uh, I think, is a recognition by investors of the low risk or the lower risk. Um, nature of uh, at least uh, some of these investments. Um, the thing is that the price discovery process is very slow in this sector, right? You can't short, that doesn't help. Uh, it takes six months to two years to do a deal. So it, it, it's not like all of a sudden um, the, 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 the risk preferences of investors are revealed as, and, and then you know, we, we can sort of calibrate a potential model. It's taking time. Uh, but to the extent that the underlying volatility of, um, of payouts, of cash flows, uh, hasn't really, I, for, if I take sectors where it hasn't changed, uh, like social infrastructure, for example, and you, you, you see pricing going up and up and up and up, to a point this is a recognition that, well, uh, yes, lower returns are fine because there's less risk or there, there isn't as much risk as, uh, as perhaps was previously anticipated or previously perceived because it was in the liquid asset class. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's some of that going on. But my feeling is that there's also a significant impact uh, of regulation in the sense that, yes, those who were investing uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, still are. Uh, but then there are all those who still aren't. Um, and so, for example, where I, where I live in Singapore, there is a, a fairly stringent and fully in place uh, solvency to style framework. Um, which means that insurance company can't invest in infrastructure, basically, and they would very much like to. Um, and, and, and so there, there are cases where you might think that, um, uh, well, better definition, so I'm, I'm gonna make uh, Eugene's point again, but he won't be surprised, uh, better definition, uh, better measurement of risk, uh, better data, et cetera, will help, um, and hopefully um, that's something we can contribute to, uh, will help uh, better calibrate um, prudential understanding of risk in, in this asset class. Um, the education of the, I don't want to be sound too condescending, but uh, the education of the regulators matters a lot. Um, I remember the first discussions we had about Solvency II, when was it, five years ago? Um, um, uh, sorry? 2015, oh yeah, even before. Uh, anyway, the first, the first comment we had was, oh yes, project finance, yes, it looks like a CDO. And we had, to, we had to explain, no, 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 it's not a CDO. It, 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 so uh, there's a lot of that to do. There's also this, this business of how, uh, I was talking to a banker recently, who was saying, well, the regulator is killing me because I don't have enough losses in my loan book, my project loan book. He, he, I, I'm, I'm not losing enough money. He's not seeing enough cases of actually losing money. Um, and, and of course, in an environment where few, there are few defaults, you need to think statistically about risk, perhaps in a different way than you would in an environment where you can, you can witness a lot of defaults and a lot of measure expected losses in a, in a more sort of straightforward way. Uh, so there's things like that which uh, can be done, um, which will further help. Um, but in, in terms of answering your question about whether, what we see in the, in the data, the market, doing. Uh, it's certainly uh, pricing risk uh, more accurately and signaling lower risk levels uh, than previously perceived, I would say. This may be partly a question of you know, availability of liquidity, it's maybe about, driven by a number of things, but, but uh, it, this should be uh, supporting, in part at least, a supporting uh, trend in terms of uh, adjusting frameworks, indeed, regulatory frameworks. Indeed, I think one, one of the uh, high points of your presentation just before was uh, indeed the fact that greenfield projects uh, need not necessarily be considered more risky for institutional investors uh, than uh, brownfield projects. Um, let me now turn, in the interest of time, um, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Nasbridier. So you represent the uh, 
insurance uh, industry here. Uh, could you tell us uh, about your views more specifically uh, uh, regarding uh, Solvency 2 and the related regulation, the, the risk and opportunities uh, it, it uh, presents for the, the industry? Uh, is there, in particular, a, 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 some, some kind of a risk for uh, European insurance companies to be unduly constrained um, in its capacity to allocate assets to uh, long-term infrastructure? We've just heard that uh, in some other jurisdiction like Singapore, they may also face the, the same constraints, uh, but it might not be a general case. So how, how do you view uh, Solvency 2 and, and, and should we go further maybe in, in trying to address um, this issue with uh, the regulators, with AOPAT, as we did uh, two years ago? Uh, thank you, Francois. So first of all, what I would like to reiterate, it's a strong commitment of insurance company to the financing of infrastructure. Both at the equity and debt level, there is no doubt on our side that we need to do more. And the other message is that there is a sense of urgency. We need to do more and quickly. We all know that infrastructure is closely interconnected to all the, the challenges that our society is facing today. So we want to do more for an organization like AXA with a portfolio of 600 billion. If you increase one percentage point, your allocation to infra, you see the amount to be deployed. And we are not the only one. And there is an urgency to find a solution to finance more and quicker. So I welcome all the out outcome from this uh, survey, this analysis. But on the other side, what I can say that within the insurance company, we have Solvency 2. Uh, almost 18 months ago, in Solvency 2, some adjustment has been introduced to create an asset class infrastructure, to create criteria in order to define qualifying infrastructure. This is a very positive and supportive move. And you can see the direct impact of this regulation with the appetite coming from the insurance company to do more. So of course there are further adjustments to be made. We can keep on discussing these criteria. There is need for adjustment in order to clarify some of them, to ease the discussion, to shorten the discussion, and to do more. There is currently some revision, discussion on the review of 2018 Solvency 2 with more global topics which can be linked to the risk margin cost of capital, the calibration of the equity or the volatility adjustment. There are three main pillars which has to be reviewed in order again to fuel the infrastructure financing because the direct impact will be also for infrastructure. Equity is clear. We have a capital charge which has been revised again for qualifying infrastructure, both on debt and equity. We can do more in order to be at the level that we expect. And we know that from an insurance company, we are long-term financers, so we need to be able to deploy some capabilities again to this market. If, we, if I look at the details of the regulation and the criteria, just to highlight two points which I believe can be fixed in order to follow the evolution of the market. One element, to be qualified as eligible infrastructure under our regulation, you need to be located in an OECD country. Do we want really to uh, continue not to be able to finance more in growing economy in emerging markets? I don't think that it's a good solution. There is a lot of survey, risk analysis coming from rating agency for the World Bank with some clear evidence that in terms of risk profile, you do not see significant differences from OECD countries or non-OECD countries. This can be changed in the regulation and is a process for financing this growing market in emerging market countries. Another element which can be followed, which is a trend in the market, we have seen over the last months, a number of transactions which enable to pull the cash flow of infrastructure project to achieve the minimum critical size. This is a very important step. And on the top of that, for this transaction, in some cases, you have credit enhancement mechanism to enhance the risk profile and to make, to make this project, as we say, viable from an insurance or from an investor's perspective. The issue is that if you pull some cash flows, if you put credit enhancement, you look like a securitization. And in that case, you are not anymore with the capital charge related to the infrastructure, but to take the risk as an insurance investor to, to, to be treated as a securitized product with pretty punitive capital charge. This has to be clarified. 
We do not believe it is a major step, but that will enable insurance company to move forward and to increase even more their allocation on the region which matter. Again, growing market and growing economy where we know that infrastructure has a major role to play for sustainable finance. We will welcome all the new initiatives which will take place going forward and which are currently um, on the table regarding sustainable growth, especially with the Commission. So we will do whatever possible to make it happen and to provide our expertise as long-term investors and insurance company. We want also to reiterate the fact that we, are, we have the expertise to assess an infrastructure project. You just have to remember that uh, we are insurer and that we insure most of the projects. So the knowledge, we know it and it's in-house. So do not consider insurers as a new players. We need to learn about how to manage this type of risk. We have expertise, but we also know that we need to find a deal, deal, deal pipe of projects which are in line with our risk appetite, i.e. with stable cash flows, and in some cases with risk protection against digital risk that we cannot take on behalf of the policyholders. You also have to keep in mind that all our investment needs to back the liabilities provided by our policyholders. So we have a certain appetite for risk. We can find solutions to create the deal flows. We are part of the G20 initiative. We are part of all the dialogue with the private and the public sectors. We do not believe that the question is new, but we urge the participant to move forward and to be sure that infrastructure is at the top level of the priority for all the market participants, the public sectors and the regulators to enable us to do more. So in a nutshell and in a conclusion, very significant improvement for Solvency 2, a lot to be done. The direction is uh, it's, it's clear and you will have all the insurance company sectors behind the infrastructure as far as we will have some revision on some identified topic in Solvency 2 in order to do more as it is the better match for our asset and liability management on a long-term basis. Thank you, Emmanuel, for drawing a kind of roadmap for a future potential adjustment. And if I don just for a minute my former bank, uh, World Bank hat, I, I can testify indeed to the fact that uh, projects in emerging countries are not necessarily riskier than in mature economies because they dollarize, because they involve multilateral development banks, uh, uh, structuring and guaranteeing. Uh, so indeed, it, it shouldn't be taken as a, a, a sort of proxy for a necessarily a riskier uh, subclass uh, of projects. Let me now turn to uh, Veronique uh, Omezzano from uh, BNP. So basically, uh, same question to, to you, uh, Veronique. Uh, on uh, behalf or on account of the banking industry, what, what's your views uh, uh, on the risk and opportunities? I, I understand the Fédération Bancaire Française has taken some quite uh, critical views uh, of some of the conclusion uh, of the FSB report, challenging both methodology and impact. Uh, would you like to elaborate a little bit on how you see uh, this, uh, this particular issue? Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be uh, able to, to, to speak on behalf of, uh, of BNP Paribas, but also of the, of the banking sector. Um, I, I very much agree with, with uh, everything that has been said uh, so far um, on the, the progress made, uh, but I think um, we also need to, to consider the overall financial sector and a lot of the uh, discussions, including at the B20, to be fair, uh, and maybe at the FSB as well, has been around how to crowd in private investors in the sense of, of institutional investors, not only insurance companies, but pension funds and asset managers at large, uh, with a kind of implicit um, recognition that banks were uh, at the same time crowded out from that asset class by financial regulation. So um, I would like to, to remind first uh, a couple of uh, numbers very shortly. Um, infrastructure debt is uh, more or less two-thirds at a global level of the infrastructure finance in general. So the other third is, is equity investments. This is not in the hands of the banks for obvious risk reasons. In these two-thirds of infrastructure debt, uh, it is splitted two-thirds bank loans, 10% MDB loans, and 25% bonds. So you have more than the double of uh, bank loans compared to bonds at this stage, 
it has been relatively stable in the last uh, couple of years, including um, even maybe five, 10 years. Um, and of course, we would welcome, because we're also a structure of bonds, so as BNP Paribas, we would very much welcome to do more market-based market finance, but it should be complementary, not a substitution to the bank financing capabilities. And therefore, preserving, I would say, the bank financing capabilities is, is a very important um, uh, goal that I, I hope the policymakers uh, share with the banking sector. I, I like uh, when Emmanuel says we want to do more. Uh, BNP Paribas as a bank would not like to do more also, but maybe our hope is that we are not forced to do less. So it's kind of slightly different perspective. So. Back to the FSB report, it's true that, um, first of all, we, we welcomed very much that in line with the G20 priorities on infrastructure, the FSB selected infrastructure finance as its uh, first um, implementation of the new um, Im effect um, impl implementation analysis. What, sorry, I, uh, the name is, uh, escapes me for the moment. Uh, we also contributed to the methodology, I mean, the, to the, the earlier consultation on the methodology, uh, and of course, we would like better the FSB to look also forward as opposed to just looking at the mirror view of existing implemented regulation, but we recognize the difficulties of that. So uh, all in all, we very much welcomed the fact that infrastructure was really the, the, um, the, 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 the it was a strong signaling uh, sig uh, factor to have this first uh, report on infrastructure finance. The report itself, um, I guess, is not really a surprise, I would say. Uh, it's not really a surprise that the regu regulatory body says that the re regulatory reforms worked, right? So uh, we were not so hopeful uh, to, to see a lot of criticism, to be fair, in this report. Um, and actually, we noted that uh, this maturity aspect was, uh, was uh, uh, recognized, um, but overall, it I would say when I talk to the project finance people in, in the bank, I'm not a project finance expert, um, the story they tell me is slightly different from the story that is in the EFSB report. Uh, there has been a massive transformation of the business model in infrastructure and project finance teams at the bank and at our competitors, uh, not only in France, uh, but globally. And by the way, it's relevant to, to maybe listen to the French banks because there are four French banks among the top 10 players worldwide on infrastructure finance. This is certainly the only league table uh, where there is such a concentration of French banks active in this market, and, and we're proud of that. Not just, we finance infrastructure not just in Europe, but also very much in emerging markets. We did that historically. We have great teams, great skills, great expertise that we want to put at the service of the, of the real economy and at the society at large. So yes, we have transformed our business model, and yes, it has been driven largely by regulatory changes, because otherwise we would have liked to continue to grow this business. What has been done? For the, for the top league, if you like, of banks involved in, fin in, in infrastructure finance, the name of the game has been to change the mix between margin income and fee income, i.e., because we were early on in projects and we had structuring roles in projects, we could continue to grow this business and having less final take, so less exposure on balance sheet, so that overall we could absorb the doubling of the capital charge, which has been not specific on infrastructure, but has happened uh, as, as, a, as a consequence of Basel III, we could absorb that and still have a decent ROE at the end of the day. Um, by the way, the ROE has been cut at banks, but that also is an intended consequence, so I'm not going to discuss that. But the, the issue with this is that the smaller players in the banking industry, those that were using uh, the, the secondary, the, the, the syndicated loan market to, to take a participation, those were crowded out of the market because if you cannot make it work by a sizable fee component of your return, then you cannot invest your capital. So that in itself has opened the door to institutional investors, maybe uh, you know, to the benefit of, of, of their capability and to the, uh, I would not so much say insurance, but the non-regulated sector like asset managers. So that has been a, a, a profound transformation. Now, if we look forward, uh, we see a significant threat with the implementation of Basel IV. Um, 
why is this, and why is this especially despite the fact, as noted by the FSB, that, uh, that the, the, the Basel Committee has finally uh, accepted that banks could continue to use their um, internal models to, to, to model uh, infrastructure finance and specialized lending in general. This was, I have to say, uh, I think a, a push for France and it is very welcome. The problem is the output floor because the banks will have to have the two calculations, the internal models and the standardized model for the output floor calculation. And believe me, for a low risk asset class like infrastructure finance, the output floor is going to be biting. It's going to be double biting because the criteria to recognize the security packages, the, the, the collateral packages under the standardized approach are very, very poor. Physical collateral is not recognized. Physical collateral would only be recognized in case there is a marketability of that physical collateral. So imagine what is the marketability of a bridge, of a toll road, or anything like this. So this means under the standardized approach and the output floor under Basel, every project finance is going to be considered as fully unsecured. I will stop there, but I think uh, I, I would welcome more debates uh, thank, later Thank you, on. Veronique. Yeah, you did raise a, a number of very uh, uh, <laughs> important issues from the, the crowding out of tier two banks to the fact that uh, indeed the, the, the revised Basel III package could eventually entail uh, shorter, costlier or rarer bank financing for infrastructure, not unlike the immediate aftermath of the uh, global financial crisis. So let me now turn to uh, Olivier Gerson, and you have the, uh, the challenging task, I, I, I would say, of alleviating some of the concerns that have just been expressed uh, by uh, some of the participants uh, uh, in terms of uh, existing or upcoming regulations. So what's the uh, EU Commission uh, position on this? And, and more broadly, uh, how can we try and reconcile the, the need for stability, which is at the basis of financial regulation, with the need for growth uh, and investment in, in infrastructure, both economic and social? So the floor is yours, Olivier. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, indeed, I mean, we, and I think we, we have been taking a number of measures in order to favor infrastructure financing. Uh, now, is it any infrastructure? Uh, do we need to be careful about creating uh, asset bubbles in that field? Do we want to have empty airports uh, in Europe, et cetera, et cetera? And there's a number of trade-offs that needs to be, to be discussed as well. Uh, a couple of words maybe on the FSB uh, review. The FSB review uh, was prioritized as a result of an initial request by, by Euro the European Commission. This is a proposal we put forward. We're happy it was taken up. I do not share uh, the doubts, but I mean, it's not true that uh, when regulators review what they've been doing, they systematically find that uh, it was good. The best way to do this is not to review, frankly. Um, so, and we have made uh, in Europe our own review, which we called uh, the call for evidence. And uh, I have to say, in, the, in this specific field, we have received very few evidence. What we have received is the same old plea by market players that this is bad, this is very bad, etc. But evidence, no. So, and probably one of the well, you may you may object that one of the reasons for this is that it's too recent and that the detrimental effects are not yet there, which is what you call Basel IV, probably true, because it's not yet even in place. Um, but um, we were reasonably happy with the methodology of the FSB review, that there is indeed no significant material impact on the, uh, on the financing of infrastructure. And let me take you an example. Uh, what I think deeply is that, uh, in the end of the day, a number of the phenomena we can see in terms of, for example, decreasing investment in equity uh, is probably not helped by financial standards. But when you look at long statistical series in Europe, at least, you see that the decline predates by quite a number of years the introduction of the new regulations. So this is true, for example, for the investment of uh, insurers in equity. It started to decline in the early 2000s. So I'm happy to put on solvency all the sins of the world, but probably solvency didn't help to restore the uh, investment in equity. But I think we, you need to go a little bit deeper into trying to find what are the roots of, uh, of a number of these, of these issues. So 
yes, we need to have more uh, financing and infrastructure, but the, the issue is as much a question of qualitative nature as a question of quantitative nature. So what I would say is, does financial regulation prevent financing infrastructure? I don't think so. Should financial regulation promote the financing infrastructure as an act of faith? I don't think so. I think financial regulation should try to mitigate the, in fact, desirability of having more investment in certain infrastructures with prudential factors. And indeed, this is, some of you said it, this is a question of data available, this is a question of being actually able to relate this investment to lower risk over the long term. Uh, and, uh, and then we, we can do something about it. So, does that mean that financial regulation should not be uh, uh, busy with uh, thinking how to tackle infrastructure financing? Neither. And I think we, we've proven that we, that, we, that we do this. Solvency II was, was very much uh, discussed. Um, at the moment, the investment by insurers in infrastructure is uh, under 50 billion euro. So it's less than 0.5% of their total assets. Should it be higher? Yes, certainly. Uh, but the prudential rules that applies to those insurance companies uh, certainly have some influence on the, uh, on the, on the investment behavior. But as was discussed, uh, it so happens that infrastructure benefits from a favorable treatment under, under Solvency II. Um, as Emmanuel uh, mentioned, I mean, we did that in two phases. Uh, first, by providing for lower calibrations for infrastructure projects, and then in the second phase for infrastructure corporates. Um, and I would like to underline that we did that, we, the regulators, so the European Commission, against the formal advice of the supervisors. We have, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, we have divided by four the prudential calibration that was uh, proposed to us by EOPA. Which is maybe an act of faith in the end. Uh, but it is clear that it would be better to convince the supervisors that there is indeed a lower risk in investing in infrastructure uh, so as to avoid being, having to, to make too many acts of faith. Um, so both amendments are in place. And the Solvency II framework has introduced a new concept of qualifying infrastructure investments. So insurers need to hold a lower level of capital against their investments in these infrastructure projects or, or corporates. So for instance, the risk calibration for qualifying debt instruments in infrastructure corporates have been reduced by 25% on average, and for equity investment, they've been reduced by up to 27%. So it's not completely negligible. What we hope is that with those modification, and assuming there will be good quality investment opportunities, because there is an issue of supply and demand in Europe, uh, I mean, those that object to a favorable treatment of prudential calibration say, well, it's not a question of uh, lack of availability of financing, it's a question of lack of projects. There is some truth in it. But assuming there is no too much of a lack of projects, uh, we anticipate that insurers can at least double their investment in infrastructure over the next 10 years with these uh, calibrations. Very quickly, a second issue uh, is asset management. We have created a vehicle that's called LTIF. There are currently 10 LTIF uh, authorized, that stands for European Long-Term Investment Fund, um, that are authorized in, uh, in Europe. That's very low. Although we believe there, there are a number of uh, advantages, uh, in particular for insurers, to, to use LTIFs. We are aware of some of the shortcomings. The main one is that uh, uh, with the current institutional structure of Europe, it's impossible to provide for one single favorable uh, tax treatment in Europe. 
uh, but still would like to understand better uh, why the taken up is, uh, is not better than this. And the last uh, word on banks, uh, I agree that we need to encourage banks' uh, investments in infrastructure projects. And this is the reason why, in the context of the current review of uh, CRR, which is being discussed by the colleagues later, uh, we have proposed to introduce a more risk-sensitive treatment of high-quality infrastructure projects. So capital charges uh, for exposures to infrastructure projects will be reduced, provided those projects comply with a set of criteria that is capable to lower the risk profile and enhance the predictability of, uh, of cash flows. Um, maybe a last word on sustainable infrastructures. As I said, there is an issue of qualitative nature of infrastructures. We want to favor the investment in infrastructure, not in any infrastructure. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, all the purpose of the work that we have uh, started on an EU uh, taxonomy. Uh, so a classification of what is sustainable, what is not against uh, six uh, basic objectives. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Olivier. I I'm sure we, we will have a lot of questions yet to, uh, to discuss or, or, or try and answer, but I'm afraid we've been caught up by the, uh, the hard stop deadline that has been put at, at 1.30. So uh, maybe you could just join me in giving a round of applause to our, our panelists. Um, Th thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Congratulations for the timing. Uh, Absolutely perfect. We are just on time. Thank you, Francois, for the moderation. Uh, the issue of the regulation is a very key issue uh, concerning the development of the infrastructure financing. Thank you very much to uh, Olivier Gerson to have participated coming from Brussels. And thank you to all the speakers.